So hi, everyone. Uh, we're here. I mentioned uh, uh, at the last All Hands uh, that we were going to have Josiah Citron uh, come out and visit, and that uh, he was a nice guy that we talked. He was willing to, to give us a, an actual demo, which I think is a, a very special treat. And I, I also pointed out that he was arguably um, the, the best chef in Los Angeles. I, I, I've eaten at his restaurant. If you haven't, <clears throat> Elise, it's, it's really worth uh, going to and, and checking out. Um, he's also got some really interesting, I've, I've learned more from looking at the internet, some really interesting concepts on, on food. He's gone through a very interesting evolution personally in his life, and uh, hopefully we'll share some of those experiences um, and answer some questions. I'll, I'll point out three things. Uh, he was one of the, the first uh, chef owners to win uh, two Michelin stars. Uh, there's four of those restaurants in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, Melise was one of the very early ones. He lives local to Google LA in, here in Venice. Uh, so if you want to stop over for lunch, uh, I <laughs> thought I'd give it a shot. And he's a surfer, so I know we've got some surfers here too. So if you have surfing related questions or tips you want, uh, here's the guy to ask. Um, and he's been, uh, they've been very generous in providing us books, uh, which is the author in pursuit of excellence. Uh, they're, they're in the back. And uh, there's actually a great, I'm not going to give a more detailed intro, because there's a really great intro of you in here and some interesting pictures, including surfing pictures, which yes, yes. I think is awesome. So thanks so much for uh, joining ah, us. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So well, welcome. Thank you all. OK, so. Okay, I, as uh, Tom said, I'm from San, I was born and raised in Santa Monica, uh, native. And everybody says there's no native Californians or LA, but Helen and Julie knows I am one. Um, I grew up here surfing out in Santa Monica. Uh, my mom was a chef. Uh, not a chef like I am, per se, but she had a cooking school, actually, in Santa Monica, where the Santa Monica Place is. I guess a new, old, new mall. Um, so she had a cooking school there, which was called the Southern California School of Fine Cuisine. Uh, most of the time she taught at that time was mostly rich executives, wives, how to cook. Uh, she had a great palate, uh, a lot of different interesting cultural foods. Um, I, so I grew up with some amazing food in the house. And um, uh, the good thing now is if I said at eight years old, I knew I wanted to be a chef. But that's not true. I just wanted to surf. So I would peel some carrots here and there. and. Uh, and try to uh, make a little couple bucks so I can go on surf trips. Um, but then when I was 17 and I was, you know, time to go to college or what am I going to do, I decided, you know, I, I want to be a chef. It's kind of when uh, Wolfgang Puck was getting known, 1986. <clears throat> At that time, it wasn't like now, obviously. We didn't have uh, Google, so we couldn't check everything out and see, and there wasn't this wrath of information. So at that time, uh, it was the beginning of the Celebrity Chef. And uh, so I went around to five different chefs, and I asked them, what should I do? Should I move to France? Should I work? Should I go to school? Because my dad being French, um, I have uh, papers to go work in France. Um, and four out of the five chefs re recommended that I just start working. So I got a job at a restaurant that was called, uh, the first job was at The Wave, which was right down the street here. Uh, they just a new restaurant just opened there, so it's on Ashland and Main. It used to be 20, uh, 2020 or 20, I can't, World Cafe. Just turned over. Um, so that was my first job. It lasted for like a month and a half, and then they were going out of business, so let everybody go. Uh, so then I went to the West Beach Cafe. I don't know if anybody remembers the West Beach Cafe. It was Bruce Martyr, who has Capo. He had the Broadway Deli, um, a Chorus Cafe, maybe. You know what? So I went to work there for six months, and you know I kind of got addicted to the chaos of the kitchen, uh, the adrenaline rush, and um, I was enjoying it. I had a girlfriend who I had been dating in high school. She wasn't enjoying it. I was working too many nights, so she dumped me. And from there, I decided to move to France. So I moved to France, and I lived there for three years. And it was really a wonderful experience, culturally, uh, learning about cheese, wine, food. I mean, at that time in, in America, we didn't have these farmer's markers. We didn't have all this available fresh produce and fresh seafood. It wasn't the same. It, you know, it's not, we've come a long way in the 26 years that I've been doing this. Um, so I moved to France and just learned all about that. I uh, worked there for three years. And after three years, it got to the point where it was kind of like, well, should I move back to California? Um, 
should I stay in France? Kind of like, what am I going to do? I had to kind of start developing my, my life. I, you know, I want to have a bed and a TV. Um, anyway, so I moved back to LA and I got a job at Chinois in Maine. I came back to work for Wolfgang Puck. And um, it's a great experience. I learned a lot. And I wanted, you know, in France at that time, there was no influence of uh, Asian products. Or they, it was all French. I mean, maybe a, a hint of ginger. But besides that, they didn't use anything in the French cuisine. So I really wanted to learn about, you know, different ingredients from different parts of the world and how to introduce that into French style cuisine. So that was a great experience at um, Chinois in Maine. From there, I went on to work at Patina. So Patina is a great restaurant. I mean, at that time, it was Joachim only had Patina. There was no Pinot Bistro or Patina group. So it was really hands-on, and he really taught me a lot about running a business or and what it meant. So from there, I felt like I was ready to go on my own and become a chef. So I actually got a job with my friend Raphael at um, oh, Capri. is where we got our first job, which is now that Wolf and Sheep's Clothing. It's kind of hot right now. So they did, the guys that are doing that actually did what we did in 1993. We went in there and kind of took over the restaurant. Uh, from there, we got a job in Jackson's Restaurant, which was on Beverly Boulevard. You know, the restaurants come and go. It's hard in LA. These are all, you know, <laughs> can't remember them all. Um, and then from there, Rafael Lunetta from Giraffe and myself, we opened Giraffe Restaurant. Does everybody know Giraffe Restaurant? Yeah. All right, so that's why it's a J-I capital R. It's for Josiah and Rafael. Okay, so we grew up surfing together. That's my best friend since childhood. We're still friends today. Our kids are great friends. I'm the godparents, and he's the godparents of my kids. Um, so we opened Giraffe Restaurant in 1996, and we had a lot of success, and it did well. And in 1997, uh, we won the Best New Chef Award from Food & Wine Magazine. So that was a huge accolade. It was all that, at, like I said, at that time, the internet wasn't what it is now, and you couldn't, there was no blogging, and no one know, would know you if you didn't get national press. So we got the national press, and then our restaurant became a lot more popular. From there, we were invited to cook on cruises, to do demonstrations, and so you get your name out there. And every time you get to go away and do those events, you learn. Because you have 10, 15 chefs coming together from around the country, and you can learn. It's great. You see other chefs, what they're doing. You see different techniques, different ideas. So it's a really great experience. So that was wonderful. And then in 1999, I kind of wanted to live my, have my dream and have a really fine dining restaurant because that's what I trained in in France. So I really wanted to, you know, open a fine dining restaurant. So I opened Malice Restaurant in 1999. And um, we've done really well there. It's been great. I think Malice Restaurant, for those who've had, I know a lot of people have been there. And uh, our goal at Malice Restaurant is to create an experience, a great experience, a memory, a souvenir of a time in your life, or maybe a birthday, an anniversary, uh, promotion. So that's really our goal. So it, we really work hard. And that begins for us, shopping at the farmer's market, procuring the ingredients that we're going to use to prepare. Because that's the first and most important thing is if we ha don't have great ingredients, can't make great food. So it starts where you have four or five of us go to the market every Wednesday, the Santa Monica market. And on some Saturdays, one of us goes, not as many on Saturdays. And uh, it's pretty much of a treat when you go see us there because we really, we really scour through everything. I mean, we are basically hand-picking each ingredient for our diners. Each ingredient is hand-picked to create that experience. And that's where the experience starts for me, is every morning in the kitchen to create it. Moving all the way through to the front of the house. And in the front of the house, it's really about creating an experience of kings and queens. Right? So when people come in, we want them to feel like kings and queens. So every now and then we actually get a letter where people say we felt like kings and queens, and that's like you know then we know we're really doing our job well. All right, so that's really our goal. Um, so that being said, today I would going to demonstrate a simple mushroom soup, mushroom soup with a, a truffle mousse and a little hash. I always like to add something to a dish to kind of give it another dimension, a textural dimension. But before that, we're going to taste a little molecular gastronomy because I know that's pretty hot. So. I think they're ready. They can bring in the spoon. So the first thing we're going to do is something we serve it as an hors d'oeuvre at Melise, which was inspired by Ferran Adria. Well, it was actually inspired. The, the flavors we use, the technique was inspired by Ferran Adria. The flavors we use, the grape uh, wrapped in the goat cheese and the pistachio, was inspired by when I was in France, I didn't get paid. So after work, I would go work for a caterer, and I would roll these goat She just huge amounts of catering. And, a lot of uh, weddings, Jewish weddings. So I would roll grapes, 
with goat cheese and pistachio. So that became a, 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 an hors d'oeuvre at least since before molecular gastronomy. Then I said, well, I want to use these same flavors, but I want to make a modern presentation. So this came up here where we have a, um, a sphere of uh, grape juice, and inside of it is a goat cheese, and it is then macerated in uh, pistachio oil, and then we sprinkle a little pistachio on top, fleur de sel, and cracked pepper. Fleur de sel is the flower of the salt, the best salt available. One of the best salts available, but what I think is the best salt. There's a lot of great salts out there. Um, so this is made with, uh, we, this is made by using alginate, which is a kelp product that's been modified. Um, and uh, calcium gluco, gluco, which is a calcium lactic and calcium gluconate. So what happens is this is a reverse spherification. There's two kinds, right? One is a sodium chloride solution that you put the alginate mixed with the ingredient inside of it, inside of the solution. The other is a reverse where you put the alginate as a solution of water bath, and then you put the gluco inside of it. So it seems easy, but different flavors and different you know, amounts of pH, it changes everything. So you have to go through it and find it. Most of that work, though, is being created by scientists. Most chefs, I mean, we don't have to be in there doing that. We have dinner to do. So luckily, we have a lot of help from food scientists, which when I was growing up, I never would have thought that I would ever rely on a food scientist for anything because it's kind of everything opposite for what you learn in the, back in the old classical style of French cooking. So we're going to pass these out, and then I'm going to start getting prep preparing on the uh, mushroom soup. So for the soup, what we're going to use is we're going to use some mushrooms. We just have some white mushrooms here. And then we have some uh, dry porcini mushrooms here. Um, we have some onions, leeks, a little garlic. So the garlic here, we take the germ out of it. So with all our garlic, we always take that little the germ that goes down the middle out. That's really the part that kind of, when you get, after you eat a lot of garlic and you start getting interjection, that's the part, you remove that, it really helps. That's the bitter part, okay? So remove the germ. Some onions. We have some celery root and we have some apple. I find that the mushroom is set off nicely by the celery root and the apple. That really uh, strainy root vegetable with the acidic of the green apple, okay? Then we have some good old uh, cream, chicken stock, mushroom stock, and uh, some bay leaf and thyme, some chestnuts, okay? So when, when we start, when you, whenever you start, you want to start off by, well, I mean, the idea we're trying to do, we're trying to coax flavors out of these ingredients. So we want to find a way to make these taste like the most amazing onions, leek, celery root, all together in one. So we're going to coax the flavors out. So to do that, I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit. We're going to sweat the onions and the garlic inside of a little butter. Now, everything is the quality, so the best butter you can find. I think clover butter is a great butter available at Whole Foods. Uh, they have all the imported French butters. Uh, most of those have been frozen, so it doesn't mean it's not as good, but some have been frozen. Okay. Oh, I never saw things go so high. So when we're sweating it off, you want to add the butter and you want to sweat it off slowly. Um, by the way, I'm cooking on induction burners, so this is a magnetic heat transfer. They're great. I mean, they're not really caught on that much in restaurants or in homes, but it's not like usual electric. So everybody says electric's bad, but it's boiling now. I can just turn it down, and instantly the heat stops. Okay. Yeah, we have two induction burners in the, in the restaurant, and the next time I remodel, I want to do my whole kitchen more induction if I ever get to that stage. I got two kids to send to college, but, <laughs> but I like to uh, do the induction burners. Okay, so here we're gonna sweat this off now. To bring out the flavor, the most important ingredient is salt, right? And I think it's how you use salt can really determine how you 
how much you use. So by putting a little salt in here at the beginning, right, to bring out the flavor. Uh, this is a, a sel gris. Sel gris is a, it's a French salt, a sea salt. This is what we use in, in all um, of our seasoning for everything, our basic seasoning. We don't use kosher salt. Um, we use sel gris. Uh, used to be, it used to come in, it's really wet salt. Okay, and so we used to get it in, we had to dry it out, and we had to grind it in a mortar. Now they, more and more people start using it, so they make it come in this form, which is ready to go. I don't know, it used to be like dry it out, grind it up. It's a lot of work. Our Roboku never had a blade. Okay, so here we're just going to sweat this off. We put a little salt in, and then we're going to add the leeks and then a little salt also. Every time we put an ingredient to cook, we're going to add a pinch of salt. Right, and we want to sweat that out until it's soft and translucent. It's about five to seven minutes. Okay. So always mixing it, really, you know, bringing out the flavors, slowly cooking it. And then we're going to add a little bit of celery root. And at that point, too, we're going to put a pinch. Now, when you're, eat, when you're using salt like this, it's just a little bit each time. You don't want to over salt it, right? And if you're going to reduce something, you, you can't do that. Another time when you don't want to add salt in the beginning is when you want to make something brown and crispy. All right, because it's going to leach out the water. So basically, we're taking out the water, and so now we're going to simmer it inside of its own juices. Okay? And then we're going to add the apples. Make sure. This is nicely cooked down. Okay, then we have the mushrooms. So when we put the mushrooms in, we're going to turn the heat up. Okay, because mushrooms are going to leach a lot of water out. Okay, so we have to turn it up so we can reduce down and concentrate the flavor. So add the mushrooms. Turn it up, so down again, we're going to add a pinch of salt. So it's pretty interesting, right, the, uh, the grape, the way it, so what happens, it cooks the outside, okay? So the alginic in the, in the, lac, in the glucose, they, they have the chemical reaction, it starts cooking it, all right? So the alginate's cooking the lactate inside of it, so it keeps cooking. So if you leave them overnight in the solution, it'll be like a ball, you can bounce it on the ground. But we leave it in about, probably about a minute, minute and a half, two minutes. Okay, so we're going to cook this, and we're going to let this cook down. Okay, and then uh, another part of this dish we have is we're going to have a mushroom and potato hash. So while this is cooking, I'll kind of go through this. So basically, what we have here is we, have, we like to use Yukon potatoes, right? Great Yukon potato is a big one, right? Okay, so we cut this into a dice. Okay, and then we're going to put this in water. So one quart of water to one tablespoon of salt. That's the ratio we always use the restaurant. We're going to put it in cold water. So whenever you cook potatoes, you want to start them in cold water. Okay, and the salt already inside. We're going to bring it to a boil slowly, but not all the way to a boil. Never want to boil potatoes. So co contrary to what everybody thinks, like when we make mashed potatoes, we don't boil the potatoes. All right, because we don't want the, the sugars and the starches they get activated and then they get that gummy flavor and they lose that flavor. It starts to, trans it starts to change the, uh, the sugars in it, okay? So we want to cook it until they just cook through though, and then we're going to take them out, strain them out of water, and we're going to dry them really well. Okay, we have to dry it really, really well. Then we're going to take some of these white mushrooms. So if you're going to make some fine, well, if you find some porcini mushrooms, that's the best when they're available. Um, then we're going to take these and you want to find the biggest ones you can, because these we're going to, the white mushrooms, we're going to remove the, um, we're going to dice them. So it's a lot easier the bigger they are. And then we're going to cut them into nice little dices. Now, whatever, you would cut the mushroom bigger than the potato because 
the mushroom is going to shrink more than the potato did. So we can end up with a nice size hash like this. I don't know if we'll all see it. I'll be in the soup. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. Okay, so then we just cut them into a nice dice. A little bit bigger than the potato would be. And the mushrooms, you kind of got to work fast because they will start to oxidize once they've been cut. So you got to kind of go fast once you do this. So this would be something you do at the last minute. Okay. Okay. So we have our we have our mushroom hash, mushroom and potato hash. Then we have our soup, which is cooking. And then we're going to make a little. In the recipe, there's a really complicated way to make this truffle mousse. Okay. But I'm going to show just a little quicker way we can do this. Um, right now, so we're just going to take some creme fraiche and some whipping cream. We're going to whip it up. We're going to grate a little fleur de sel, put a little salt inside. And we're going to grate a little black truffle, fresh black truffle season right now. Right. This is the black diamonds. <laughs> this year, it's not. It's been a hard year because it's been so cold in Europe. So um, it's freezing. So it's going to end really early. They're much, you know, any way they can make it more expensive, they always do anyway, so. <laughs> so we're just going to take the uh, little bit of creme fraiche, a little bit of heavy whipping cream. So we use uh, Kendall Farm creme fraiche at the restaurant. And uh, we also use um, uh, clover cream. From the, and unfortunately, I'm kind of trying to, I'm kind of like thinking about petitioning uh, Altadena, maybe to start more of a, a couple of chefs we're going to try to get together. Maybe they'll start more of an artisanal side for their milk, because that's the localist we have here, one of them. I don't know how many long people are in LA. There used to be a creamy right here in San, uh, Edgemar. So Edgemar Building, you know what the Edgemar Building is, Ben and Jerry's? That was Edgemar Dairy. So that used to be, they used to bottle milk. It's crazy, right? They, it used to be a milkman, right? Imagine years ago, the milkman would go to every house and drop the milk off. That was coming from local places. Uh, kind of cool. So hopefully, uh, Altadena might start you know, doing something like that. OK. So we're going to whip the, uh, whip it up like you would to make. So while this is cooking now, we're going to add the chicken stock. Oh, sorry, we're going to add the chestnuts. The chestnuts now, chestnuts you can find, right now it's not the season, so it's frozen chestnuts. They're really good. Um, and then uh, if you have fresh chestnuts, it's great. You have to kind of slit them down in the middle in the book of the description, and you roast them in the oven at like 375 degrees to then skin loosens up and you can peel them off. Okay? Uh, I, my bag, I need a spoon to do the quenelle and a few other things. All right, so then we're going to add the chicken stock, and the mushroom stock. Now, if you don't have mushroom stock, it's not, it's not necessary to have it. How do you make it? Um, you make it, we just take mushrooms, white mushrooms. Basically, the easiest way to make it at home would be to fill a pot with some white mushrooms. If there's wild ones available, throw a few in there. Don't cover it all the way with water. Cover it three quarters of the way with water. Sprinkle it with salt. Thank you. A little bay leaf, a little thyme, okay? And then from there, you would uh, well, bring it to a boil, let it to a simmer, and let it cook until it just 45 minutes until all the liquid comes out. So it should be more liquid than you started with from the mushrooms. And then you'll strain it out and taste it. If it's not strong enough, reduce it slowly by half. Again, in the beginning, you put a little salt, not a lot, because you're going to reduce it after. And it's mushroom stock, great. Stocks always make a lot more than you think. Throw them in the freezer. Never underestimate. If you're going to make stocks and you want to cook, make your own stocks, make the stocks. Take a day, make the stocks. You know, cool them down, and then freeze them. Uh, great to have them. They're better than any store-bought stock you never have. Okay. Okay. So we're going to bring this to a boil. We'll let that simmer for a while. Okay. <coughs> then we're going to add the cream inside. And then we're going to simmer that for a little while. Simmer it. We don't want to boil it too hard. Always bring it to a boil. Simmer it. We're going to simmer it, and then. Uh, as you grow taste, I think it's good taste because cooking is, uh, I mean, it's evasive. It runs away. Sometimes it tastes amazing, and you go, wow, it's good. And then 15 minutes later, it doesn't taste the same anymore. So you really want to catch it at that right moment. So taste as you go, little taste as you go. You really want to catch it. 
it's important. I try to teach all the young cooks, you know, you want to, you know, capsize that one moment when it's perfect. So I'm whip this up. I don't do this anymore, so, you know, it takes longer. milk and making curds and whey so we're separating it out the farmers market they have one right now it's a big thing it's not pretty much raw milk is done right it's, I mean they're, they're the FDA is raiding Amish you know communities right now it's for, I mean, they've been doing this for hundreds of years they're raiding they're arresting them it's pretty sad I mean sad sad state to be in about the raw milk you know okay. so but anyway you separate those curds and whey and then uh, obviously, I'm sure a lot of people, you heard of like Noma. And these restaurants are, you know, kind of getting popular in the, so here we don't have to worry about this stuff, but it's fun to play with it. We have the vegetables all year. But, so we've been playing with fermentation and aging vegetables and see what happens when you try to preserve them. It's kind of fun to do it. And one of the ama most amazing flavors is when you make like sauerkraut, but you use whey. And it's like the amount of whey to 12% salt and you put the whey in. It's amazing, the smell, the flavor, it's great. We've been doing it like kohlrabi and salsify uh, with kale. Okay. okay, so we just want to whip this like this, so it's, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to turn it into butter, but we just want to whip it. Do we have nice soft peaks? Soft peaks like this just to form a nice canal. Okay. All right. So now, once we get to the, the, the texture we want, we're going to grate a little truffle in here. So, microplane works great for the truffle. Just a little bit. Once you whipped it up to what you wanted, you don't want to whisk it anymore, so put a little salt. And then we're just going to fold it together to create the, to get the texture we want. There we go. Lightly fold, fold it in, just like making a mousse. Okay. Then we have this here. So our soup is done here, right? It was done, we put everything in. Um, basically, the cream goes in, we cook it, okay, and then at the end, we're going to turn it off and we're going to infuse the mushrooms in, okay? So we're going to put the mushrooms at the end. We don't want to cook those mushrooms, they get a little bitter. So we're just going to put it in, stop it, and let it infuse inside, okay? There's also bay leaf and thyme that actually goes in here when you add the stock. I left that out, excuse me. All right, so now we have our, our beautiful soup. It's done, right? It's ready. The magic of two pots and TV and things happens like that. <laughs> um, so then we're going to put it in the blender. So the blender is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, kitchen utensils because, um, well, I guess it makes, these Vitamixes make such fine purees. And we use so many purees at the restaurant. Our food is based on, you know, really taking an ingredient and playing with it in a lot of different ways. I'll explain one of the dishes in, in, at the end. Um, so the blenders really help with that. Back in the old days, we used to have to do it where I had to, um, you know, we had to put it through the robo crew, or we had to just write through the tammy, you know, the tammy hours before they had these powerful blenders. The tammy would take for hours, right in here. Get strong arms, but whew, <laughs> difficult. Okay, so we're gonna turn the blender on, and whenever you use a blender, you want to start by, uh, on, a, on a low, very on low, so you want to turn it on and slowly turn it on, because so we've all done, they all turn the blender on, have to clean the ceiling trick. All right, so this we're just gonna turn it up, so it's And we're going to blend it, you know, until it's pretty smooth and creamy. And then this is a little thick, so I'm going to take a little, steal a little of this. So if it's ever too thick, you just add a little bit. Even I can't do it right every time. So, you know, cooking is always, you know, details, little extras here and there.
Okay, so now at this point, there's two ways we can do this. We put it through a shinwa into another pot. Okay. But we're gonna add some butter into it's blending to get nice and frothy. And at this point, we're gonna move really high. Nice and tight in it. At this point, we have a beautiful soup. Do you have the hand mixer? Can I, is it, can I use it? Or after you do that, it's fine. But it smells amazing. You're gonna taste it. So it smells amazing. Um, beautiful. All right, good. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna strain it into another pot because, or into a tureen, a soup tureen, or a fancy pot. Because I like to present the soups and then do it all table side. So at this point, we put this in. Let me put this back on here. And now we have a beautiful soup. So we use the hand mixer. You don't have to. So at this point, you can go right into the, into the pot. And then we have our, how's that soup taste? So just one quick note on pureeing and doing hot purees. So if you're going to make this soup, thank you. If you're going to make this soup and you're not going to serve it that day, are you going to serve it, you're going to cool it down first? It's important you just can't put it in the fridge, right? Whenever you cool something down, say you're making soup and you want to make a lentil soup or for the week of saying to make a stew for the week, I don't know, something. You need to take a big bowl of ice, stainless steel bowl of ice, and then put another bowl on top of that. Or put a bowl beside it and you want to transfer what you're going to cool down into that, put it on top of the ice and then slowly mix it so you cool it quickly. Flavor-wise, like I said, things disappear quickly. You want to do that for that? Once we're done, we hit that spot we want it to be at. We want to try to keep it in that area, so when we heat it back up. Another reason is health reasons. Bacteria forms, when you put it in the fridge, it cools way too slow, especially in plastic. So just a little side note on cooling things. So it's, a, it's called an ice bath, we call it, a water bath. Okay, all right. So now we have our, our, our mix, right? That's, we're just gonna finish sauteing it up. Do this, it gives a nice smell. That tastes pretty amazing, right? The hash and, okay. Saute this up. Okay. So it's about, I think, the, the texture between the hash and the, the mousse and the soup. So everything we do there, we try to give a little bit, you know, different little extra added uh, texture, flavor to take the levels to make it the complexity more. So this you just saute them up the mushrooms, simple, reheat it. Or we'd start from the mashed potatoes and the mushrooms where you'd saute them to get the mushrooms golden, add the potatoes and saute them to the nice and golden. And then we'd season this at the end. This is one of those things you want to season at the end because we're trying to keep it crispy. Put a little thyme branch in there. Time. You can add, you know, this is, cooking is one of those things you feel free to add. In this book, just because the recipes are written out, doesn't mean you have to follow those. Follow the techniques, follow the ideas, but it's up to every individual to kind of play with it and have fun. I hear some of you, I can't make that in the restaurant. Too many ingredients fall. Cherry pick, make the vinaigrette, or make the sauce, make the puree. This is a book, because if I did a book where I just made everything simple, we say, well, why is it so simple? At your restaurant, you don't cook like that. So it's kind of like, you know, catch 22. Okay, so we saute these up nicely. Or we can just come cook for it, Melise, that's true. And then we're just gonna kinda form a nice mold here. I'm gonna decorate this out. It smells nice. Everything you know the smell is so important to cooking, right? This is important, so this is the part, this is the part I love. This is, right, you hit, these, these are great. Bad mix, creeping out ones. 
and she's been that's what they're doing outside there. They're hitting it every time. They really get it light, airy. Okay, so I think you can see how bubbly it is and beautiful. So at the restaurant, when we finish it, we'll, we'll put the quenelle on like this, on top of the potatoes. We do a quenelle. This is a technique in French cooking called quenelle. Right? Looks easy, right? <laughs> it's not, trust me. Most of the time, it's a big thing in the restaurant at least, we do a lot of quenelles. So all the cooks that come in, they start cooking there. It's like, OK, you have to learn how to do quenelles. Well, we can't afford them to do truffle mousse quenelles practice all day. So the trick is get some Crisco, go home after work, sit in front of the TV, and do some quenelles. Did Ronnie ever do that? <laughs> See? Proof, it really happens. Huh? Cool Whip. There you go, Cool Whip, Crisco. It's true, so it really happens. OK, and then we take a little bit of garnish here. So I like to, oops, here we go, a little garnish. A little chervil on top. So I'm going to use these tools. These are actually forceps, actually cotton tweezers. My best friend's a dentist, so I go by his office and I steal the <laughs> cotton tweezers. <laughs> Two things I steal from him, actually, at the restaurant. One, as we all know, the syringe, right? Because we have the chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. So I take the syringes from him and the forceps, or the cotton tweezers. OK, there we go. So now, at home, if you're cooking this and you're doing this dish and whatever, any dish, any soup, and I think it's great. So you put this at the table in front of the guests. And then we come around here. And then we would uh, just pour it around. It comes out so nice and bubbly and airy. That's the, the hand blender just at the end. Or you can do that in a blender also. You don't have to have the hand blender. You can just run it in a blender for a while. I don't know if I can see this. And then there's our mushroom soup with truffle mousse and hash, chestnut mushroom soup. Everybody can see this here. Uh, maybe you can pass it around, that's fine. OK, so as I was saying at the restaurant, we like to do a lot of dishes based on uh, purees. And I'm, I'll talk about one dish we do right now. It's called, uh, I like to say just broccoli and beef. Okay? So we take the broccoli, and we, take, we try to find the longer broccoli with the long stems. We take that off, we peel it, and then we braise it off. So it really gets sweet, has a crunch to it. But really, the best part of the broccoli is the part that usually ends up in the trash. OK? It's true, right? And so we take that, we, we roast that off, we braise it and roast it. And then we take the broccoli crown, and with some of it, we make a pesto out of it. So we're always trying to find, what can we do a little different using the ingredients? So we make a pesto. But instead of using Parmesan cheese, we use uh, aged Gruyere cheese, or Cantal, uh, great flavor. Um, so we put that conté, we put that in the pesto with pine nuts and a little bit of garlic. And all the garlic we use, we remove the germ. And a lot of it, we triple blanch. That means we put it in cold water. We bring it to a boil once, chill it, and do that two more times. So three times we do that process. It talks about in the book also. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, so then we have the broccoli, roasted broccoli stem. We have the broccoli pesto, and then a the, uh, few other pieces of broccoli, pan roast them with a little bit of uh, Meyer lemon zest and some of the same cheese. So kind of like cheese and broccoli. Right? That's the play on this, right? The cheese and broccoli, American classic steakhouse. So we have our there. And then the last part, we take the, uh, the leaves of the broccoli, and we deep fry it. So we have the, three, the four parts of the broccoli in different forms. It's wonderful flavor. It's interesting. I think it's intellectual in a way and on the plate. And then we have the beef. We have the ribeye that we roast. And then we slowly finish it on, we kind of mark it on the uh, hibachi grill. And then we have the cheek that we braise for 24 hours, the Wagyu beef cheek that we braise for 24 hours in red wine. So we have two different kinds of beef and four different kinds of broccoli. And that's what I think is what about food is playing with it. Thinking how do we, I don't, I'm not really super molecular we're at Malise, we're, we have, but we're, I'd say we're modern cuisine, but we're not molecular, OK? A few things like the gluconate and things like that. So that's kind of the idea of the, behind the food that we try to create at Melise. All right, so I'm going to do some Q&A right now. So anybody, I think we have some microphones and questions. Anything you want to ask about, like surfing, <coughs> where we're going to surf tomorrow morning, the wind going to be the right way, <laughs> check surf line. Yes? I want to know more about what you cook at home, what you cook for the kids, okay. and sort of things like this broccoli cheese pesto. I'm like, oh, I, my daughter would love that. Exactly. What, what else can you suggest? OK, for my kids, you know, well, the difficulty with kids is one likes one thing, one doesn't like something. So, but a lot of times at home, I like to do like things like uh, chop chay. 
I'll make a very, I get some of the, the sweet potato noodles and do something with chop che. Every Monday I usually cook at home on Monday nights. I like to do rotisserie chickens. I had the Ronco rotisserie. It's great. I mean, you know, I, you, we brine the chicken. Then we let, overnight we let it sit in the fridge and then I, put it, I throw it on the rotisserie, throw the potatoes under it. Those are really good for days when you have things to do with the kids and you've got to go out, you put it on an hour, come back, your dinner's ready. I and mean, you could put some, you know, mixed carrots and everything underneath it and it drips and it cooks inside there. Um, other things I do, like uh, the other night I just did tacos. I mean, made some tacos. My kids like that. I just got buffalo meat instead. And then I used that. Uh, there were some great at Whole Foods. I actually go shopping for my food because I, I don't want to go on my day off to the restaurant. So then we, I used cabbage, sliced cabbage inside, made a pico de gallo. I mean, I, I might make a little, you know, different things, different ideas. Um, soups, we do a lot of soups. I like to make like minestrone where like I'll make a sweet a squash broth and then put diced squashes in it and some pastas and, the, you know, different beans, kind of make a different version of minestrones. Um, what else do I cook for my kids? I mean, always they like the grilled meats. They like grilled meat or they like the, you know, they have out, you know, my wife, she makes a lot of times at home for the kids. She gets the, the it's actually the cow meat frozen at Trader Joe's. And the kids love it. So it's easy. I mean, you know, it's just, I think, trying to add something like the broccoli or we always try to add something healthy with it, a vegetable, whatever we do. You know, you make the stuff, uh, you know, a good thing for home. I mean, it's not healthy, but you take some, grated Parmesan cheese, and some butter, and some lemon zest, and some parsley, and you mix it in the, um, in the, with some bacon inside. You put some sa sauteed bacon, and you mix it, and you roll it in the logs, in the Cuisinart, throw it in the freezer, and you want to make carbonara. You have carbonara. You put some egg in there, too. And then you mix it, roll it in the, like, logs, and you need, carb you need a fast meal for the kids, boom. You have your carbonara, slice it up, throw it in the pan, it's done. But anyway. I mean, what else do we cook at home? <laughs> huh? So I said, that's not healthy. This isn't so healthy. <laughs> but um, it's delicious, all right? Uh, other, you know, I, I mean, at home, I, you know, it's hard because we have this, we have this, uh, I'm never home at nights, so my wife is always, and she's not really a cook. So we have this discussion when she's ordering takeout too much, so I got to go home. Like, maybe I'll make enchiladas on a Monday, and I'm going to freeze them so she can heat them up later in the week. So pick your day to cook, I think, and then prepare things and then freeze it. So you do order takeout. Oh, believe me, they had five days this week. We had a big discussion last night about that. Like, too much takeout. <laughs> yeah, that's, but it's, I mean, it's hard. Kids are hard because one likes one thing and the other doesn't. It, that's, that's the problem. My son eats anything. My daughter eats pasta. Even if we order La Cabana last night, if they order La Cabana, just so you know, I'm honest. Yeah. I've been going to La Cabana since I was, I mean, it's kind of like a ritual, because I went there when I was eight years old. So we, we were there last night. My daughter, she only eats the rice and beans. So I said, you can just make that. You know? And my son eats the chicken, not the, the tortilla part. So it's like, what's the point of Orient there? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Do you still own giraffe? You know, I'm not a, I, I don't own giraffe. Um, but I'm still friends with him. And we do own a restaurant together. It's called Lemon Moon, which is on Olympic and Bundy. And the Lemon Moon name is actually, because it's, our, my last name is Citroen and his last name is Lunetta. <laughs> so it's Lemon and Moon, and that's how we got the name. And now it's popular because Lemon Moon Ludovice has been there, it's like the last couple nights, so. Yes. Um, so I've heard stories about how it's like really cutthroat competition in the chef world, and you sort of made this sound like it was really easy. So no. <laughs> a okay. More. All right. It is very cutthroat. It's hard, and it's yes. It's a, that's a great question. In the sh it's cutthroat in the chef world, but it's every business is cutthroat. Everywhere you look, it's cutthroat. I mean, it's very competitive. It's hard. It's grueling work, um, and you get some. A lot of it's luck. I mean, it's different now, right? You go on. So people that can't cook, they go on a TV show. The personality works. They win the TV show. Then they're a famous chef. It happens all the time. You're going to see in 10 years, we're going to pay for all this craziness as the TV when you have no good chefs anymore because all people want to do is become a TV chef. So many kids come out of school and their attitudes all get famous. It's, but you have to learn how to cook.
first. But it's cutthroat. It was hard. I mean, we were competitive in the kitchens. I mean, you're always fighting to get the next position. I mean, you want to be the better one. Uh, it's very competitive. I think uh, I try to have a different atmosphere at Malise, and it's not so competitive. But I mean, competitive people succeed in life. That's the thing. And I mean, unfortunately, it works that way. Always pushing yourself to be better. I mean, that's all the way I look at competitiveness. So I'm very competitive. I don't like being number two. So there you go. Two. Yes. Uh, the first one is, do you, um, in your kitchen, do you tend to like people who come out of, straight out of culinary school, or you prefer people who just who <coughs> have worked at different restaurants and pay their dues, so to speak? Okay, so culinary school or working? Well, my, I prefer the working, not the culinary school. Not, if you just take away two equal cooks, two equal work ethics, but school, one is carrying a huge debt, okay? So what you get paid in the kitchen is not much. So most times you hire someone that needs to pay back that debt. Once those, you know, it comes due, the, the, you have to start making the payments. Then a lot of great cooks end up in a hotel in banquet cooking. Could become a great chef. They end up in banquet chefs because they need the money to pay it back. And then, you know, becoming a chef, it's a, it's, it's a, like say it's it's a it's a marathon, it's not a race. So you hit the pinnacle, they're making forty thousand dollars and they're done and they're in a banquet kitchen and that's it. And it's all about how much money you're gonna produce, you know, you have to we want a nineteen percent food cost and this, you know, so I think that that's why. And I've had great successes, you know, Ronnie. I don't know everybody knows Ronnie here. Yeah. Right. So Ronnie came to dinner one night. If you don't know the story of Ronnie, she came to dinner one night. Um, had dinner Liked it, came in the kitchen, talked to the chef, said okay, and I guess emailed a couple times, didn't get response, said damn, I'm gonna bring in some ma cake or macaroons. She came with, I wasn't in there at the time, and then I was out of town at the time, came back, and then we had Ronnie work in the kitchen. So no, no experience, nothing. Ronnie successfully worked three stations there in a year, pretty good rapid going around. Excellent job, I still use it all the time, and whenever, she's not working there anymore now. But. Whenever I have, you know, she comes and helps us whenever she can, so it's great. So that's a person, no kitchen experience came in. But it comes down to being smart, you know, common sense, smart, good work, work ethic. So that's a, a <laughs> next question. Second question. Yes. <laughs> um, you said you did your training in France. Have you, if you've been back to France recently, what is a great city to go eat? Okay. And or in Europe in general. Okay. I know there's a lot of that's like, a good that's a good question. In the you know because of Noma. And yeah. Now so like where would you uh, go? Where would I go? Well, I go back to France pretty like every year and a half. I like to go to France. Paris is my favorite city in the world, no matter what. Maybe not the food's not what it was. It's not you know, but it's to me it's the best city in the world. I mean I love Paris, but I mean I think there's so many places to go. I think it's a journey. I mean I haven't been to Noma and these restaurants. So I can't say it's great or not. I plan to go. So it, I think the the best answer the my, the my best answer to that question is the best place to go is where you have a desire to eat. What restaurant interests you? You know, I can't say one or the other. It's what you really want to go. Go to where you want to see and what interests you. I mean, Paris is great. Le Lyon. If you like cream and butter, go to Lyon. I was in Lyon last year. <laughs> Let me tell you, I came back sick. I never want to eat again. It was so much cream and butter and everything. Foie gras everywhere, and everything they eat is so heavy. But it's good. It was good. Um, the south of France in the summertime, if you want to eat grilled, you know, Mediterranean fish and nice pizzas. I mean, Italy. Italy to me is one of the best foods there is. I mean, especially so fresh in in Spain. You have all these restaurants that are, you know, in the San Sebastian area. So many great places. So it's pretty much a never-ending journey. I mean, there's a great place in Brazil now. You know, it's in the Amazon, in São Paulo. It's called uh, Dome. This guy's cooking things that we don't even know what they are like because they're getting it from the Amazon, so it's not known ingredients to the rest of the world. It's doing amazing stuff with technique. So, like I said earlier, this information travels so fast now. There's so many amazing places that you can find, and people can go in the middle of nowhere and do something, and then people can find them, and then we can go. So it's, it's a hard question. Tokyo is a great food city. If you have, I mean, that's, to me, when it comes to eating, you can't go wrong in Tokyo. You can eat Italian food, French food, Japanese food, Chinese, and you can eat every food in the world and it's pretty much done better than anywhere else in the world. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. I mean, uh, coffee, I, there's just an article about 
open coffee shops aren't there's not a lot of coffee shops in Japan. So they're starting to become popular. They don't one coffee shop will not serve espressos yet because they can't make them properly. The the espresso drinks, so they're only doing Americanos or drip coffee. So I mean that's a to their culture that's amazing. Next question. Yes. What are some things oh, Uh, what are some things I can do to be a, become a better home cook, given that I'm not going to, unfortunately, go to culinary school or, or come work at release? OK, well, I think first off, is to become a better home cook, start off by good ingredients, um, taking time. And I think cookbooks are great to use. Uh, I think there's some great books, like uh, Mario Batali's books are amazing. They really have a lot of basic stuff and really good technique, sound technique. Um, the Julia Child books, they're good too because they teach you technique. I mean, this is classical stuff. And there's books like my book. It's harder stuff, but we really go through and talk about the preparations and the way you think. So I think it starts being a, a way of thinking, a way of cooking things, taking time, buying the right ingredients. But whatever you do, I think it's reading the recipes three or four times before you make it. And, and the more knowledge you put inside, inside then when you're cooking, this happens. You know, it's like all of a sudden you know to move the pan now. You know to turn it down because you've read so many different recipes and different ideas. And I think that's the basic way if you're not going to go to read cookbooks, read food blogs. I mean, I said Nancy Silverton books are really good. Um, I think the Jada de Lantis books are pretty good too. I mean, for ba you know, basic, start basic and work your way up. <coughs> it's the best thing to do, I think. I, I mean, cooking classes and all that, it's not, it's not real. It's, you have two hours to do a class. It's not. It's great to go, but I think just reading great cookbooks. Yes, you had a question? Actually, uh, Matthew, Matthew. Had a question. Is there another restaurant in LA or other chefs that you look up to, admire, and you look, you look forward to going to? Yes, I, there is. I mean, I have, I had an all-time favorite place, which is called Mori Sushi. I looked up to this. He actually sold it, but I would look up to go there a lot, as much as I could, because he had such deep knowledge in fish. And he, you know, I talked to him. I learned so much every time I went there. Um, other restaurants I admire, the chef at Patina right now is a French gentleman named Tony downtown. He's amazing. Uh, Providence. Um, there's other places I've been that are really good. Uh, I like Gino Angelini. He makes great Italian food. So there's a lot of chefs I like here. I mean, Lee Hefter from Spago was an amazing chef when he was at Spago. He's pretty much corporate now all around. Um, oh, there's so many places. So, I, you know, I try to, you know, keep my be humble and like everybody around and, and you know, want to learn from everybody I can. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Any more questions? Any more questions? I saw other people with their hands up earlier and then. Yes. Yeah, what um, sort of techniques could you recommend for preparing raw fish? Like, what do you need to look for before buying and handling? I think you need to get the best fish possible. So I, I definitely would suggest when it comes to raw fish, going to the Japanese markets like Mitsua. Um, there's another one on Sautel across the way from, on Sautel there's one off Olympic. I definitely, yeah, in the GM market, yeah, in the GM. I definitely go to those places and buy it. They have it prepped and I think that uh, keep it cold. You have to have a really sharp knife to slice it. And uh, I think it's buying the best products you can, and you know I wouldn't, you know, be, wash your hands always before you touch them, touch it. But do you place much stock in the label sashimi grade? No. Uh, no. no. That's just a step. That's just they could just say that. No. I mean, you know, go with the the people that eat raw fish. Go where they buy it at. I mean, they might put it there. I don't even think in the Gia it says that. I think it's all just, or it's just there. It's the fish. They have little bluefin tunas. They have everything. It's good. They have great things there, actually. A lot of different variety. They pretty much have, I'd say, whatever's kind of in season from the Japanese market at the time in Japan. They have most of that stuff. Because I think there's big clientele, Japanese clientele, that go buy their fish there. So that's your best bet. Any more questions? Yes. How do you stay creative? How often do you change the menu? How do you come up with new stuff? Well, creative is it's evolution to keep us creative of, pro, of dishes evolving. Um, I have a team of people. I mean, we try to we have a great chef de cuisine who's been with me 10 years who's creative. And uh, we try to get invo people involved. And we do a thing now every Thursday nights. 
uh, the cooks, one cook prepared the dish and we all taste it and critique it, so to try to keep everybody kind of being creative. And, but the most is the just evolution. Uh, farmer's market is really what drives our creativity the most. Products that you don't see all year, ingredients, vegetables that are gone for a year, fava beans, peas, don't have them, more all mushrooms, so they come back and then while well, you're excited to use them, start thinking of different ways to do it, what we can do. I mean, this year we just started doing peas and bonita together, the dried bonita flakes and peas, the sweet and that smokiness of it, that dried fishiness, really nice together. So really it's just the seasons, the vegetables, what's out there. I just try to always find it. But that's our job, to be creative, because you have to stay ahead. I'm petrified of being the guy who's the old guy who's got that restaurant that used to be good years ago. So. <laughs> You got to keep that edge always. That's why the book is called In Pursuit of Excellence. Hopefully for till I retire. I want to be like John Elway. I want to retire after winning, not not on the way down. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What's your most recent food discovery? My most recent food discovery. Well, all right, Suma, Suma oranges, Suma citrus. All right. So I, I just thought I have a little blog, so you can, I talk about it on there at josiahcitron.com. So it's amazing. So I, this was, they were there last year. They're out last year, but really small quantity. Okay. So it's a Japanese breed of of a citrus, the Depicon, Depicon. Um, and so last couple last week I was at Whole Foods and um, I saw them. So I got them for my kids and I ate one. It's the most sweetest, amazing. Fruit. I mean, to me, there's one. The perfect fruit is a pink lady apple. You know, the tart sweetness, the crunch, and then this orange. It's the same thing. It's the perfect balance of food, of in, of taste. If you if you can get that in every dish you make, you hit a home run every time. The balance in that suma citrus. So, the farmers market has them now. In three weeks, they'll have organic ones. So you can get them at Whole Foods, but if you like making marmalade, you have to buy them at the farmers market because they're not waxed. Same farmer. But Whole Foods, they're waxed, which if you eat them raw, they're both conventionally grown, so it doesn't change it that much. But if you want to make marmalade, you have to go to the farmer's market. And in three weeks, they will have uh, organic ones at the market. Yes? Um, can you talk a little bit about your book? Yes, I can. So my book is, uh, obviously, I think it's like every chef, you want to have a book. So it's, um, uh, I started a year and a half ago, I think about a year and a half ago. Well, I really started like 12 years ago, but, you know, I. The real making it was a year and a half process. Uh, probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, sit down, have to write the recipes and explain it and be articulate. It took a long time. But it's really a, a journey through what we do at the restaurant and how we think and on our philosophy um, about the way we prepare ingredients and what we do. So it's just really a compilation of the last 12 years about choosing vegetables, storing vegetables, but the, really it was a high an anxious anxiety, a lot of anxiety in the uh, making of the book. Um, editing is the hardest part, you know, because once you, in a cookbook, you go back, right, and then you realize, oh, I could say it better like this. It sounds better if I say this, and it's not just one recipe. You have to go back and try to make every single one of those recipes consistent. And once it goes in this format, there's no more word, there's no more uh, spell check and that Adobe, whatever, creative suite. There's no spell check, so it's like, wow. Anyway. <laughs> so I think we're almost out of uh, time, time on, the, yeah. on the tape. Uh, <clears throat> could I steal the last question? Yes, please. So if you could clone yourself and have Josiah too go work and take care of the restaurant side of the business, what would your uh, what would your other career be? My other career, yeah. You know, I like to negotiate and argue, so I'd probably be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I like, it doesn't matter. I always take the other side the other person has. I could care less if I even agree on it. So I think. We hire a couple of those. So yeah, let us know. That's good, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, not, thank you. Not for the, I don't even, even do it for the liquidity of the job. <laughs> just for the, I just like doing it. Me and my son's the same way. My son's the same way, so you should see us at the dinner table. Back and forth, it's, it's good. So awesome. that would be my second job. But I don't want to do the eight years of school, though. So. Well, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all.